So, Faraz, you and I have been talking uh, yeah. about youth work, mm -hmm. and you've asked me quite a lot of questions about my experience as a youth worker. And I've talked to you about uh, the fact that I worked in the inner cities of the United States and uh, that I worked on the reservations and the Aboriginal reserves in the United States mm -hmm. and uh, in any number of, of difficult situations, prisons and, and mental hospitals and all of this sort of thing. And, and so we've sort of shared the fact that, that right. both young people in the U.S. and people in Bangladesh, young people in Bangladesh, are in ex any number of them are in, in quite difficult situations given the economic system that we're we're sort of working within. That's pretty brutal, and doesn't really have their best interests at heart. Eh? Absolutely. So, I know one of the things that we've talked about, and I wonder if you could talk about it a little, uh, is this sort of idea of um, how we can no longer rely on capitalism and on corporations. Um, to be dependable um, sort of in terms of taking care of young people, in terms of taking care of families, that the role the government used to have, if it did it well at all, <laughs> um, was sort of, you know, the promise that, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll sort of take care of you in a reasonable sort of fashion if you'll work for us yeah. uh, and if you'll sort of be part of our society and, and help that society function. But that's largely gone now. That's right. That, in yeah. fact, it's corporate rule. Yeah, that's and right. And that's global corporate rule. That's right. And the global corporate rule actually um, doesn't really care, yeah. particularly for the most marginalized uh, young people yeah, uh, who absolutely. are on the very, very edges uh, of society. And you've talked about that in terms of uh, the children of garment workers that you work with in the yeah, schools. that's right. But we've also talked about an alternative, that's right. uh, a different way other than going to the foundations and, yeah. you know, begging Bill Gates, oh, please, sir, <laughs> will you please give us, you know, some money so that we can have a vegetable stand. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, about that, about uh, working with existing assets, yeah. uh, in, you know, in your, in your community? Uh, after talking to you, what I found, I know, I was reflecting back that basically, what can we do to support the uh, young people? Um, so what, what starts, and uh, we have talked about learning as well. Mm -hmm. um, what happens that, you know, uh, in, in, in context of Bangladesh, uh, young people, they're learning helplessness in schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, the entire education depends on it. You know, capitalism is the best economic system. I have been an economic teacher for 11 years, and mm -hmm. I remember that I taught my students in the 12th grade students, right, what are the advantages of a <laughs> capitalist economic yeah, system? Yeah, yeah. Right. Competition, quality, mm -hmm. specialization, division of labor, but it never talks about the downside, what's actually really happening. So the education system is as such that it goes into the very uh, the, the idea, the identity of people that, okay, I need somebody, I need a white savior, somebody from the global north, come and help me. But after our conversation, you know, I figured, uh, you know, certain things that I was like, literally, I was like, I didn't, that, that was me, in me, but I never mm -hmm. thought about it, is that there's a huge migration of people, like, from rural to, you know, urban migration in Bangladesh because of, you know, the cooling factor of, you know, a government industry. And these people live in slums and you know like you know um but there are resources that you know on both sides of the you know road i was uh, i'm working with you know i'm talking to uh, our team back in bangladesh that we can plant trees we can plant vegetable trees you know papaya trees and it produces a lot of you know uh, fruits depending on um resources that we already have there hmm. because whenever we depend on somebody else be it corporate social responsibility be it government or be it external funding agency it comes with package of conditions right. so i mean what what do we do about it and we we've talked about it all before is that so there are a lot of young people who are utterly frustrated like with that learned helplessness that i can't do anything about it i am i mean this is I don't, I don't want to give my own example, I really don't like it, but to put it into context is that I was born in the most impoverished you know, part of you know, Bangladesh. You know, mm -hmm. My father was a farmer. Uh, I'm the first one to go to you know, uh, high school and then college. Mm -hmm. So I just, something worked in me that, okay, I can work hard and I can, I can just, and now I'm studying here on scholarship in, in North American University to understand you know, coming from all the way from village to here right. in North America that, okay, you know what? When it comes to youth work, when it comes to like, you know, empowering the community, the community has to take responsibility. I mean, the community has to start taking care of each other. Mm -hmm. And there is this madness, this like, you know, illusion that, okay, if you go to high school, if you go to college and university, you're gonna get a job. Right. But there is no job. That's right, that's right. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, 
it's, I think my mission has become like, how do we decolonize the minds mm-hmm. of youth? What do you think? What would be, you know, some of the ways of, you know, uh, working so that we can decolonize the minds of youth? Well, you know, I was just I was just thinking as you were talking about uh, Janet Newbery, a wonderful professor of child and youth care out at the University of Victoria, uh, has this this uh, this article in which she talks about uh, using the the the, uh, the method of situational analysis mm-hmm. uh, to do the kind of youth work that you're talking about, mm-hmm. and and she talks about mapping not just the physical geography that you've talked about. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of uh, you know the, the the land that we might use to mm-hmm. to plant vegetables mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. Um, the fact that uh, a vegetable seller needs a tarp well is there a tarp in the local city dump or does someone have Absolutely. one in a shed somewhere yeah. uh, or um, you know we need benches well is there wood in the community that we could scavenge yeah. and, and build our own benches right exactly. these sorts of, of things of course but she also talks about in terms of decolonization mapping our consciousness mapping our emotional relations uh, mapping our our friendships, mm-hmm. and you know, Hart and Negri have this have this lovely chapter uh, in in one of their books of, called the Pores, mm-hmm. and they make the argument that we miss the fact that the most marginalized and disenfranchised people are also the most the people who are most uh, who are demanded of in a way that requires that they build social relations because mm. they have no access to absolutely um, the sort of you know bourgeois luxuries right so yeah they have to to some degree provide their own policing already they have to come up with their own child care options already they have to figure out where to get food or so they're immensely creative and productive and they've already established methods of sociality and and modes of consciousness that allow them to survive but no one has taken possibility, except for maybe Hart and Negri at the broadest political level, but at the very, very local level, no one has really said, hey, what if we mapped that? What if we, what if we started taking account of these as hidden assets, as things that, that people are already using, but they don't know the political power of mm-hmm, mm-hmm. those things because they've been taught, well, you do those things because you're marginalized because you're kind of a screw up because you're at the bottom of society so yeah you do those things but that's not what you want to do you want to do these other things up here no 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 no. right exactly decolonization to some degree in that sense is coming to understand that what you do on a day-to-day basis has force exactly right? uh, exactly uh, um, I taught in Bangladesh you know uh, expensive private schools you know um, it's interesting in Bangladesh, uh, you have 0.4% students going to international schools where the curriculum comes from Cambridge University. Mm-hmm. What's really interesting is that what's happening right in Bangladesh is that there is a very s- painful social stratification based on what schools you go to, yeah. what language you speak. Right. And for instance, if somebody speaks, and I have, well, I do not blame them, but you know my own students. You know, they would okay if if a teacher st- starts teaching, and they have a thick accent. Immediately, mm-hmm. that teacher will be marginalized, saying, "Oh, you don't belong to that class." So language is serving the purpose of social stratification. Oh, sure, and what you sure. said is that yeah. everything at a political level counts, but at that level, you know that doesn't count. The, the purpose of language is communication, not to create a social class. That right. false consciousness mm-hmm. is working really wor- strong there. And what's really fascinating in Bangladesh, you know, there's no homelessness there. Mm-hmm. Because the society, you, you can find homelessness in Canada, yeah. in the United States. Yeah. There are people literally out there on the street. There's no home. But in, in, a, in a place like Bangladesh, the community plays so strong role that you might not have food. You might not have you know, a bungalow or like you might not have a vehicle. But if there is a child out there on the street, there is somebody to look that. after him. Mm-hmm. There is somebody, maybe not financially good enough, maybe they cannot provide enough nutrition, but that homelessness works in very advanced, neoliberal society like Canada mm-hmm. or in the United States, not in a place like Bangladesh. So when somebody says, you know, there are street kids, I get a little offended. You know, they're not street kids. You know, they are kids of different community who are surviving at a different, you know, setup, different, you mm. know. So that's that's and also like when i say is that that blind mo, blind idea that whatever comes from the north is the ultimate whatever comes from you know the media is right and that 
false aspiration that okay you have to be like them mm -hmm. i mean what do you, you're a professor you tell me what is the you know, message you have you know mm -hmm. for the students you know young students in bangladesh who are going to university i'm not saying that do not aspire to go to good universities but i'm saying is that this 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 blind idea that you know their education is the best my our education is not good and well you know i i'm, I'm thinking of two things uh one there's a uh, um uh, a recent interview um, by uh, Rosie Bredotti and, and Judith Butler of, of the group Pussy Riot, mm -hmm. and they asked them about feminism in, in Russia. And, um, and Pussy Riot goes to uh, a fair amount of trouble to sort of lay out the history of, of women's struggles uh, in Russia. Mm -hmm. But they say something very interesting. They say, you can't understand what we did in Russia that got us into trouble with the government from an outside perspective. Mm -hmm. In other words, what we did was responsive to the specific local conditions and history of women in Russia. And that can't be the same local conditions and history and hence the same activism as women in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Now, they say you can kind of, uh, they actually use the term ping pong, mm -hmm. the, the experiences back and forth, but when they land in the particular locale, the particular history, the particular geography, the particular locality where the activity has to take place, that can only be configured within the traditions, the history, the culture, the geography of people in that spot. Absolutely. It can't be done by bringing something like feminism from the outside as a global concept from the United States mm -hmm. or somewhere else. It has to be rethought as feminism, as women struggle within this particular place. Mm -hmm. And Rosie Bredotti, in her talking about that, in her, she gave a little lecture after the, the interview, she said she called for what she called intimate democracy. Mm -hmm. Intimate democracy. Mm -hmm. That is, democracy in the field of intimate, corporeal, bodily, social relations, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Not democracy is this idea of government or representation or voting or, um, you know, sort of uh, marching to ask the government, please, please, or the corporations, please, please, will you please give us some rights? Will you please give... No, intimate democracy. That's the democracy between you and me when we're sitting in this room together. Yeah. Are we having a democratic set of relations? Yeah. Are we having a conversation in which you're, what you have to say from your experience is valued and what I have to say is somehow contributory? Are we struggling together in, in, with, our, with our actual experiences and selves and resources and assets as we sit here? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or are we referring to some you know, abstract set of principles and ideal ideas mm -hmm. such as child rights, for example, yeah. or, you know, democratic aspirations, mm -hmm. uh, these sorts of these things, right? A absolutely. Um, it, it reminds me of one thing is that a lot of, you know, activism in a youth ward or like people who are working for the marginalized and vulnerable people, the power relation is like almost impossible yeah. to avoid yeah. that. Okay. I mean, I'm here, this savior trying to save people on the street. And immediately when I walk into a relationship, you know, in, you walk into a room, immediately the children, the young people, they'll address me by sir. Yeah, right. And then the question is that where is democracy there? And it's very, very, very related to the context of Bangladesh, is that people who are working for the rights of marginalized, they need to be reflexive. Yeah. They need to understand their own positionality, that okay, right. does my position put the other person mm -hmm. at a like lower, uh, at a disadvantage? Yeah. Do I play that power? In education, this is so, I mean, this is maddening that, again, coming back from my own teaching experience, is that you walk into the classroom. In, in the villages of Bangladesh, a teacher is called master. And I'm saying it for sure. I'm, I'm not questioning the contribution of teachers no, making no, 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 there. No, no, no. But I'm saying at the same time, when you start by saying is that you have to call your teacher master, which means that immediately that relationship is mm -hmm. so imbalanced how will the children will start talking about democracy, the young people about democracy? Mm -hmm. And one of the most disqualifiers is that, oh, you're young. Mm -hmm. You don't understand. Mm -hmm. What do you understand about the world? I'm an adult person. I understand more than you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this professionalization is, to, you know, making an institutional relationship kills, you know, the youth work. Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting uh, set of dilemmas. I mean, when you, when you, um, when you think about uh, the conditions of marginalization in the global south, mm -hmm. 
Um, I mean, there's no question, but you have to account for colonialism, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And, and whereas prior to colonialism, mm -hmm. um, gurus or spiritual masters or master mm -hmm. um, had a certain resonance, a certain meaning within the indigenous structures and, of that society, that culture that, that functioned in a certain kind of way. Mm -hmm. But when you overlay that with the colonial relations, mm -hmm. master comes to have an entirely different signification. Yeah. Right? It, it, is a, it is, in fact, attached to the neo-colonial power structures of, okay, I'm referencing mm -hmm. the boss, mm -hmm. That's right? right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think you're absolutely, you're absolutely right, but I, and I think that um, well, you have to, when you take these, sort of, these sorts of things into account, then democracy doesn't, it has a very different resonance in the global south and very different problematics. Yeah. Um, than it does in some other places, yeah. right? Yeah. Because one has to establish relationships uh, with young people uh, and adults that break down those those binary hierarchical taxonomic categories yeah. Yeah. Uh, in ways. But the way to do that in terms of into democracy is to act together, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to do together, mm -hmm. to to find, to feel together, to experience together, to uh, to to have relationships of feeling, to have relationships of of action, to have mm -hmm. relation right, uh, in which education isn't a the sort of transmission of knowledge from above to the to the to the idiot below. Um, and but you know, it, it, just to add this really quickly, I mean, Margaret Mead has this uh, had this lovely notion um, when she was still alive mm -hmm. of what she called uh, pregenerative generations, mm -hmm. right? And she said, young people today, for the first time in history, and she was talking in the 60s, mm -hmm. but it's even more true, I think, now. Young people today um, know more about the world than their parents do. Why? Because they're already living in the future. Yeah. They're already living in what we considered to be the future. Whereas we're still, to some degree, living in a world that isn't any longer. <laughs> um, you know, we as adults uh, live in this world that isn't any longer. You know, we, we were, um, we're constantly astonished by technology. We're constantly astonished by uh, the advances in the way that the political and economic systems are working. We're constantly as astonished by the fact that we live in this postmodern uh, desert of, of, of symbols and meanings that, um, that you know, that are, are empty of signification, um, but, but absolutely powerful in their effect. These, for us, particularly for, for my generation, but I think even for yours, um, that is still... Un, unreal to us. It's unbelievable to us that these things work this way. Yeah, yeah. Children are born into this. They already understand because they live the future now. And until we as adults come to understand this, mm -hmm. then in fact, it is the young people, the pregenerative generation, who in collaboration with us mm -hmm. can understand the, the field of the possible but the field of the possible can only be built out of the present. We built this yes. world as it is this world was not given to us from on high. We create this world every day. Yes, that's right. But that also means we can create a different world. Yeah. But we cannot create a different world, as mm -hmm. the adults sometimes want to, mm -hmm. by going backwards to a mythical past that no longer exists. Yeah. It has to be built out of yeah. the elements of today. Yeah. It has to be built out of the blood, sweat, and tears, emotions, resources, assets, consciousness, subjectivities mm -hmm. that are available to us yeah. Right now. Yeah. Right. We can't go back as as people would like to do and reestablish the hierarchy of of traditional British education. Yeah. We can play at that game, <laughs> but it doesn't work, and the kids know it doesn't work. We don't know, but they know I, that it doesn't I, work. I can give examples of like thousands of thousands of children who will tell you that they do not have any interest whatsoever in going to school because, like, I have young people who tell me that first, give me a reason why should I go to school? Right. Why should I write exam? What's the point behind it? But, you know, obviously, I don't want to talk to them in a, you know, young people, their, their capacity is, I mean, sometimes it astonishes me, you know, dumbfounds me, you know, I mean, young people, what they can do. I work with a lot of young people, and one of the most common challenges they tell us that, well, you know, Pharaohs, when you try to do something, immediately our parents or the society who are older say, oh, you're young people, you're just a kid. But right now, what's happening in Bangladesh is fascinating, fa you know, fantastic. Mm -hmm. A couple of days back, I was watching a documentary called Startup, where people from all over the world, especially young generation of Bangladesh, they are doing global music, like you know, mm -hmm. somebody from Bangladesh and getting on in the studio and like mm -hmm. making music with somebody from Africa, somebody mm -hmm. from the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. Things are happening. 
But when you have this factory model education, that kids are coming to class and you tell them when to stand up, when to sit down, when to eat, when to go to bathroom, for God's sake, <laughs> you know what happens? Giving them the notion is that you have to be absolutely submitting to the system and you don't question. And I say this to Bangladesh right now, that right now, education-wise, Bangladesh is statistically, we have shot through the roof. But in terms of critical thinking, oh my right. God, oh my God, the country is in a limbo. Mm -hmm. One group is going after, other group, other group, just, and we are fighting with each other. Of course. And as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, it, it might sound, it might hurt a lot of people from my community, is that it doesn't really matter what's your last name. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter that what's, what, what my father is. It doesn't matter. We have fought that, you know, like war over hundreds, years, hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter what happened 200 years ago. Okay, we had problems. I get it. But let us focus what's our problem right now. Like 20, 2012, 2012, according to you know, UNICEF, 2012, 68,000 children in Bangladesh died drowning. Mm -hmm. There is a global you know, climate change and we are suffering. Mm -hmm. So let us tackle the issue that, okay, what can we do to help these kids so that, you know, they don't drown to death? I mean, I mean, I have seen and worked like, you have high rail line, railways, right? And on that slope, you have a small shadow kind of thing where a woman is living with her child. You go on the track, you die because, you know, the rail, the train is going and you slip a little bit, you go in the water and you drown to death. And in, it's also something that, you know, I absolutely, and I, I will tell you that I will never, ever again say to a woman or to a marginalized person is that I have a degree and therefore I am <laughs> superior to you. <laughs> Their resistance is amazing. Yes. The every day. I mean, I, I said, I, Hans, I have seen kids like myself drawing water from the, like, literally sewage and drinking that water and not falling sick. Right. I have seen kids, and you can anybody can see that in the tail stations, like kids are sleeping in a way. You have got thousands of mosquitoes, but well, they're surviving. Yes. So I will lay all my hats down to their feet and say, I am sorry, I do not, I do not hold any position whatsoever superior to you. You are superior to me in every shapes and form. Well, I mean, the very idea that there is that there's a hierarchy. Yeah. And taxonomy is tr is profoundly problematic here. Yeah. I mean, you certainly have. And when the when the child comes to you and says, "Why should I go? Why should I get an education?" Yeah. That's a different question than why should I go to school. Yeah. Uh, and these two things are unfortunately sort of brought together. Yeah. Right. The school is a place of hierarchy, stratification, uh, and and taxonomies. Right. In which there are dumb kids and smart kids and disabled kids and blah 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 and this caste and that caste and this family and that family blah blah. Right. Yeah. Education is specifically not that, yeah, yeah. right? So, education is specifically the combination of, as Foucault says, of what he calls subjugated knowledges, which is the knowledge of the woman living next to the train track, that yeah. sort of knowledge, in combination with yeah. the sort of broader thinking about social issues and understanding of the global economy in, in, in the configurations of language that might assist in, yeah. when we bring them together, yeah right, mm -hmm. in an, an, a new understanding of what is possible for that woman next to the tracks and for you, yeah, for us. For, and it's, it's collective. It is, it is not for, oh, I'm going to help. God save us all from people who want to help. <laughs> um, it, is not, it is not to help. It is for us. It's not for the child. It's not for the youth. It's not for the woman by the track. It is all of us because we are all going to commit global suicide. Yes. And... It, we are all have a stake in this. It's not just the poor children of Bangladesh and the, you know, the poor children in the inner. No, 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 no. Their fight is my fight because at the end of the day, that's coming to me. Yeah. That day, that is not going to stay there. Yeah. That is coming. Global warming mm -hmm. is not going to say, oh well, I'm you're you you're a privileged person. I'm not going to flood. Exactly. I'm not going to flood your coastline. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to uh, to produce a drought in your country because you're 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 middle class, so yeah. we won't have a drought in your. No, so we like that. Yeah. So we have a lot to learn from people who have, are capable of survival, yeah. and we have a lot to offer people who uh, are capable of survival in terms of being allies, yeah. being able to think together, yeah. being able to think collectively, mm -hmm. being able to have a sensate, intimate democracy 
in which we understand each other as living force. Yeah. And other species as well, mm -hmm. that we understand that we're in an ecology yeah. that is functioning or dis not functioning particularly well in terms of our ability to yeah. survive. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I'm, I, I was reading an article, you know, the, uh, the Slow Violence. Mm -hmm. uh, it talks about that how the ecology is dying. Yeah. The environment is dying. I mean, you know, it's, it, it doesn't take rocket scientists to understand that our oceans are dying. Mm -hmm. And when the oceans are dying, we're going to die. We are staking our own existence. Mm -hmm. And this is what I personally, again, coming from an educational background, like, you know, I try to tell, you know, my colleagues and, you know, everybody, you know, especially from Bangladesh, saying that, you know, it's not really high, edu high quality education if my young kid can speak English. It's not critical thinking. Language is not what's high quality education. I mean, if, uh, if, I mean, this is again, understanding, drawing off of an Apollo Ferrari in yeah, yeah, yeah. pedagogy of the oppressed. If a child on the street knows how to say, good morning, sir, hello, sir, how are you, sir? No, it is not high quality education. Understanding what's bothering him, understanding how he can solve this problem. It is the youth to understand, okay, there is a swamp next to my house and that swamp is causing malaria to mm -hmm. That's hundreds right. of kids in my community. All right, I'll roll up my sleeve and I get down there, clean the gutter, and I will solve it. Yeah. You know, a couple of weeks back in Bangladesh, a four-year-old child fell in a manhole and died. Mm -hmm. And you know what's really painful, like, and again, I mean, I get a little passionate and try, is that, you know, there are stories, I know that, you know, that child, when he was in that, you know, manhole, was, you know, crying out for his mom, that mom help me. Mm -hmm. The question is that there are a lot of young people in that community. They could, when they saw that manhole, all right, we don't need to wait for the government to come and close that. How about there, my child, my brother, my nephew could fall and die. So let us cover the that. manhole. Cover the manhole, right? Or let's say the road has broken because of monsoon and kids cannot come to school. I, I'll tell you that kids that I work with, they have a very tough life. Mm. When they want to come to school, for them, it's a relief. For yeah, them, to get that, away, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So the kids cannot come because, well, perhaps two feet of the road has broken. But we young people can literally take, you know, a basket and shovel and mm -hmm. like, like, you know, <laughs> a spade and fill that gap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this is what I'm, I'm, I'm utterly inspired. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you is that, you know, I, I, I know that is, you know, I learned from you is that the community has to start taking care of itself mm -hmm. by taking care of each other. Mm -hmm. And that perhaps to me is a very powerful message. Yeah. Well, and it's our community, isn't it? It's yeah. all of our community. We yes. have local conditions that we have to be responsive to, but the community is all of us. Yeah. Um, it's us, right? Yeah. And yeah. I mean, yes, uh, you know, there's this, there's this lovely uh, quote. It's a meme, actually, on the Internet, so I'm not sure who really said it. Okay. But I think it still makes some sense, which is, you know, if insects all died tomorrow, if all the insects died tomorrow, we'd all be dead in five days. Yeah. If human beings all died tomorrow, all other species would flourish. <laughs> That's true, though. Right? That's true, yeah. We have to change that relation. Yeah. If we're going to have long-standing um, duration mm -hmm. on this planet as a living species, as, as, as humans, mm -hmm. we've got to shift that relation. Mm -hmm. And the first place to shift that relation, and I, I apologize to my, to my colleagues and, and, and brothers and sisters who, who want us to fix our relation with, with other species first, mm -hmm. I think we have to fix our, our relation to us yeah. first. Okay. Then we might be in a position yeah. To be able to reach out to other species, yeah. Um, but if we don't shift our relations with each other, mm -hmm. no amount of being good to the polar bears is going to make any difference, <laughs> because we will ultimately undo all the good we will do, mm -hmm. because we can't function mm -hmm. among ourselves mm -hmm. in a reasonable way. So we'll 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 get the 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 polar ice or or get the polar bears situated, and then some other asshole from over here is going to go shoot them. <laughs> um, so until we get that set of relations sorted out. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not saying you shouldn't, in fact, take care of the polar bears or you shouldn't become a vegetarian or any of the other things you might do to try to remedy our relation to the species, other species. Mm -hmm. But until we understand our own relations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's sort of like, it's sort of like decolonization yeah. and, and all the well-intentioned, mm -hmm. um, you know, previous colonists mm -hmm. uh, who now want to come and decolonize mm -hmm. uh, the global south. Yeah. Well, how about you decolonize Detroit? Uh, how about you decolonize Toronto? How about you decolonize? And I don't mean the the relations with people from other col from other colonies and other. Col I mean decolonize your own whiteness first. Yeah. So until we decolonize our humanocentric 
epicene mm -hmm. until we shift our relations away from centering us as humans at the center of things yeah. until we understand ourselves as an ecology yeah. um, we, yeah. have, we have very little to offer yeah. just in the same way that those of us who are white have very very little to offer people in the global south or previously colonized spaces yeah. unless we undo our whiteness first Yes. Right. and so uh, this sort of intimate democracy mm -hmm. it's the same sort of thing as in any sort of relation between let's say that you have a loving relation with someone mm -hmm. an intimate relationship with someone mm -hmm. you had better do your homework in terms of yourself yeah. uh, in order to be available to that person mm -hmm. in order to, to, f to, to bring the greatest degree of capacity for both of you mm -hmm. because if you are blind to yourself mm -hmm. That intimacy will be will be blocked. Your full creative potential won't be available to you. Yeah. And so, you, if we don't do our homework uh, on ourselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and on our own subjectivities, mm -hmm. our own consciousness, our own ability to to have sensate relations, to really feel. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. we're we're so our feeling is mm -hmm. so um, we're so numb now. We're not allowed to feel that. No, no, we feel very little, and you know, yeah. we, we we simulate our feelings exactly right, through watching movies and so yeah. forth instead of actually having them. Yeah. Uh, and the only ones that we do have are anxiety and anger and depression, right? I mean, that's yeah. sort of a limited field, right? It's not exactly. a lot of joy. Yeah. But the kind of thing you're talking about, where where you where you actually, I mean, there's this there's this. I don't know if I'm sure you've experienced this as a youth worker. Mm -hmm. There are moments, and it can be simply playing a game. It can be cooking. It can be getting together to fill the manhole. It can be any number of day to day, very mundane, not particularly exciting activities, mm -hmm. fixing the road, mm -hmm. where collectively we have this uplifting of spirit. Yes. This this joyful exuberance at our own capacity, our own yeah. ability to do. Yeah. Right, and I get so discouraged with youth work when when we start talking about um, you know the neurology of children or the psychology of children or you know the frontal lobe development of yeah, children. Yeah. And, and I think, how does this help me to get my my the people that I'm collaborating with to to have this uplift when we go and we cook a meal together, or yeah. we which seems to me to be far closer to the heart of the matter. Yeah. Um, to love, to have joy, to to share, to collectively produce, yeah. right? Rather yeah. than to you know have these sort of scientific, pseudo scientific, I would say, explanations of, of what young people are about, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and uh, one of the quotes that I recently have read is that it's not the violence of the outsider that hurts us the most. Mm -hmm. It's the silence of our friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so no, no. I, I, I would say that um, when in the morning, like, you know, when you wake up in Bangladesh and you see, you know, what's happening every day on every basis, youth work is so fundamentally important in Bangladesh. Right now, our population, according to World Bank, is 168 million, roughly 170 million people. Yeah. A place smaller than Iowa. Imagine, eighth largest population in Bangladesh. And what is striking is that 50% of this population are below 24. Wow. To make it like more yeah, contextual, 34% yeah, yeah. of the total population are below 14 years of age. Which means that, you know what? We better understand that the future of this nation, again, I'm, I know I, I don't, I'm, I'm not specifically saying that only that youth matters, youth mm. matters all over the world. I'm saying that nation, in that particular country, you have to think that this, the agency of young people, we got to listen to the young people. We cannot just totally dismiss and say that, okay, you're young, hence, I understand more than you. The adults, and we talked about the other, mm -hmm. the, the, the relationship is that the difference is a collapsing, right? Um, and that's, that's what I say, and well, I say a lot of my young, which I, I decolonize myself, I say a lot of you know young people that my, my former students that please don't call me sir because well <laughs> when I used to be a teacher my <laughs> students used to call me sir so I tell them I mean don't don't call me sir I mean you know um, and that's what we're also we say that we facilitate literacy in our you know we foundation school one of the things is that when adults come to the classroom you know in Bangladeshi culture you don't call somebody by name which mm -hmm. is against cultural context but I'm saying you can call somebody by brother or sister mm -hmm. which is very predominant but don't call somebody sir because right. respect doesn't have to come through that nomination well it of, can't uh, yeah it, it doesn't and well, respect uh, occurs between equals exactly yes thank you it's between equals right yeah yeah so yeah that from that context yeah that's mm -hmm. really relevant thank you Hans thank you so much it is it is, it is with great respect <laughs> that I, I'm appreciative of this conversation pleasure mm -hmm.